we are right now going through this series called The Big Picture. We're just trying to get the big picture of the Bible. And right now, this uh, next few weeks, we're looking at the, the church directory, so to speak, uh, in the book of Acts, of who some of the major players were in the book of Acts, who's who there, so we can get a sense of what's happening to the church now as it, as it kind of goes through some of its birth pains and moves along and spreads out into the world. So let's take a look at that. And we're uh, in the book of Acts, and we're going to start a little later in the book. Luke, who has written uh, the book of Acts along with the Gospel of Luke, he's been traveling with Paul, who we'll get to know a little bit more here in a couple weeks. He's le- it says he's leaving the next day. They're working their way to Jerusalem. We reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. Now, it's interesting that he brings Philip out here because he, he doesn't really need to if Philip is of no consequence. But Philip is featured very much in the early parts of the book of Acts and is instrumental in the fulfilling of the great commission of going not only into Judea, but into Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we're told a little bit, he's known as the evangelist and he's one of the seven. So who are these seven? Let's take a look at that. Let's look first at the development of Philip, where he kind of comes into the picture at. The church, where we're at in this moment, chapter six, the church is, has been born on the day of Pentecost. It's been growing, adding numbers daily. Just leaves them out. It's gotten some opposition, but they've stood firm in their faith. They've prayed their way through it, and it just continues to grow and grow. But then we read this. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. One of the things that we saw in the early parts of Acts here is that they were sharing with one another, meeting one another's needs. And one of those ways that they did was to, to have a, a list of widows and to provide for them. I may wonder, what's the difference between a Hellenistic Jew and a Hebraic Jew? The Hellenistic Jews, remember that, that, that Israel had been conquered by uh, Alexander the Great and was under the, the Greek influence. That's where the Hellenistic comes from, just another name for that, for many, many years. And, and many Jews had, had gone out into the Greek empire and then stayed through now the Roman empire. And they were just a part of that that environment, that culture out there. But they would come back to Israel, particularly to Jerusalem, in their old age to die because they they thought that that was a good thing. And so here they are now. The Hebraic Jews were those who had just always stayed in Israel. They spoke Hebrew as opposed to to Greek or Aramaic as opposed to Greek. So, So... they're being overlooked, they're complaining, they're handing out food, and they're like, we're, we're, no one's paying any attention to us. So, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Notice here that we've got a conflict. And we sometimes think, well, the church will never have, should never have any conflicts. Conflicts exist wherever people exist. You get two people together, you know, I want to eat this, you want to eat that, I want to go here, I want to go there. You know, it's just going to happen. Conflicts don't have to be angry, they don't have to be mean, they're just... We want different things. We want to f- go after different agendas, want different resources, want the same resource. All sorts of things cause conflict. And here is the church facing one. The key is, how do they handle it? What are they going to do with it? Let's look what they've said here. We're going to release this. This proposal pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Taman, Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Jerusalem, a Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So look what happens next. So the 
word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So they hit this speed bump of a conflict, they resolve it well, and the growth continues. More and more people are coming into the kingdom. But one of the things that we see here is about Philip is that he is the product of his place and his faith. If you look at these names, it's easy to miss, but these are all Hellenistic names. These are Greek names. So what did they do? They chose people from the Greek side of the aisle, so to speak, and said, let them handle this because they'll be able to make sure everybody's getting taken care of. So here's Philip, who's from the Greek side of things, the Hellenistic side, but he's also a man of full of wisdom and the spirit. He's a person of faith. Folks, you're all a product of somewhere. You're, you're a product of your families. You're a product of your place, where you grew up, what it's like there. And you might meet other people from different places. And you notice some differences. You know, real quick, is it soda or is it pop? If you're a pop person, raise your hand, yeah? Soda. Wrong, it's cola. Let's just go with that. <laughs> you know, we all have these, we have these little differences in the way that we look at things. And just because they were just, we didn't even realize we were taking them on. We just absorbed them in so many ways. So he's from a real place in a real time, just like all of us. But if we combine that with our faith, we bring something unique to the table. We also see that Philip's ministry is the result of good leadership. The apostles, they recognized their unique roles. They were the ones who had spent time with Jesus. They were the ones who had his teaching. And if they diverted their energy, if they diverted their attention and their roles and said, well, now we got to go over here and fix this problem over here, they, who else is going to fill in that void of teaching people what Jesus taught? So they recognized what they brought to the table. They weren't being snobby, saying they're too good to wait on tables. They're saying, this is something other people can handle because only we can handle this thing over here. And the apostles also here recognize the need for second generation leaders. At this point, the people leading the church are the people who've been with Jesus. But as more and more people come into the faith, there are going to be people who didn't travel with Jesus for three years, didn't even see Jesus, didn't even hear Jesus. But yet they want to give them an opportunity to lead at a certain level and then grow into that. As we hear on Father's Day, and I'm just talking about the importance of parents, mothers, and fathers, how important it is to recognize that there are things you're going to have to release to your children at appropriate time and let them take on tasks and roles and let them grow and find their leadership foundation as well. You know, it's one of the things, maybe you're a little bit like me, that the kids, I did, I don't, I think I'm doing better as a grandpa. I know I didn't do as good at this as a dad, is that when the kids want to say, here, can I do it? To say, no, 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 I can do it. Because I know I can do it in a fraction of the time. But there's some, well, I'm doing is teaching them, it's just, well, you can't handle it. You know, you just wait, just wait. But if you go ahead and let them start doing things now, then they, they get that habit. I know it can take longer. You know, time stands still. When a four-year-old says, I can buckle myself in the car seat. And you wait. And you, you know you could go boop, 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 and you'd be done. But they're, they're trying this and that, you know, and, and everything. And, you just got to fight for that patience. But it's important. It's important for them to learn that they can do things themselves and get that, that sense of capability in their life. As the narrative goes forward, we go into chapter 7 and we're introduced to Stephen, who was mentioned here as one of the seven. 
Stephen is going around and he's telling people about Jesus and he's, he's actually doing some miraculous things and, and people are impressed with that. And again, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leader, religious leader, step in and call him to account and say, listen, what's this about? Because people are accusing him of talking against Moses and of talking against the temple. And so what he does, it's just a beautiful, beautiful message on the Israelite history and showing that at the end of the day, the temple and Moses were all pointing to this moment and this Messiah and that something new has come. And it's not that they were bad, but something new has come. Well, this made people really, really mad and they decided what they needed to do was to put him to death. And so they took him outside the city gates and they stoned him. And one of the people there was a guy by the name of Saul giving his approval. He was a Pharisee. And we would later, we'll later see that Saul is known as Paul. But on that day, we're told a great persecution against the church just broke out around Jerusalem and into Judea. So the disciples began to flee and move out. And here's where we begin to see the mission of Philip. It says, those who had been scattered preached the God word wherever they went. Remember what Jesus said, as you were going, make disciples. Here they're then, they're doing it now. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. Now, it's interesting, of all the places that Philip could go, that he chose to go to Samaria. Remember, the Samaritans and the Jews had a lot of animosity between them. The Samaritans were descendants of people who were brought in to the northern kingdoms, to the northern tribes by the Assyrians, and then intermarried with the people who were left. Some people got moved out, some people got moved in. And they had their own capitals, their own places of worship, all that to themselves. And they just hated one another. They looked down on one another. And so for Philip to go with the news of a Messiah to Samaria was breaking a cultural boundary with the gospel message. Sometimes we are tempted when we think about who needs to hear the gospel, who would be open to hearing the gospel. We keep it within our affinities people who are like us. But the gospel needs to go everywhere, not just across the room. We, we, need, we have our own cultural boundaries, our own little lines that get drawn in the sand, and we need to be willing to cross those and not make a predetermination that somebody wouldn't be interested or in the gospel or is not worthy somehow to hear the gospel. But as he goes there, something interesting happens. It says, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery and had, uh, in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. That's the name he gave to himself. And they're like, oh, yes, he is. Look at these things that he can do. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So here's Philip. He's going out with the message of the gospel, and that message led people to believe. They led them to believe. If we go into Romans 10, Paul is writing, and he's talking about the difference between following the law versus the message or the gospel. And he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To call on the name of the Lord is to put your trust in him. How then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? 
And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Philip had some good looking feet. He was a beautiful footed person because he was taking the gospel with him. Wherever he went, he's taking the gospel along with other disciples. But here's, here's this guy, Simon, and something is going on here. We're told when the apostles who were still in Jerusalem heard about what was going on in Samaria, they sent Peter and John to check things out for themselves. Could this really be true? Was something being compromised? How can these people that we've never liked how could they be in the kingdom of God? So they went to see. So through the laying on of hands, they confirmed that all of this was approved by God as the Holy Spirit came on the Samaritans as well. Now you will see in the scriptures that there's a couple of different distinctions I want us to make here. There's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and then there is the Holy Spirit coming on somebody. And when you see that in both the Old and New Testaments, it's referring to that there is the ability to do something miraculous. Might be speaking in tongues, might be prophecy, uh, might be some miracle, but there is a difference that we see between the indwelling and the Spirit coming on, and you know, sometimes it can be just temporary. So when Simon, we're told, saw that the Spirit was giving at the laying on at the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And he said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this guy isn't like in it for the kingdom. What he's seen here is like, man, I've had this following and my followers are starting to go that way. And he can see that what Philip has done is the real deal versus whatever sorcery, trickery he's been able to do. He recognizes that. So he thinks if he's going to get his power back and even expand it, he's got to get a franchise. And that's what he's offering up. Look, give this to me, not so he can do the miraculous thing, so that he can turn around and put it on other people. As a gift? I don't think so. So he can begin selling it. So people will think he's great. So belief resulted in these decisions, but it didn't always result in faith as in the case of Simon. He believes, but he's not really trusting. Something else is going on. The message led to belief, but Simon's belief was transactional, not transformational. Simon is in it to get something for himself, not to have his heart turned from stone to flesh, not to, to have the heartbeat of love within him so that he is motivated by love for God and for others. No, he simply wants power. And that's, I wish we could say that was the only case in church history that that's ever happened. We have to make sure and check and make sure, are we coming to God because we recognize that there's something inherently broken within us that needs repaired, that there is a, a new spirit and a new heart that we all need within us, or are we coming so that God will do something for us? We might say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here because I've heard this concept of hell and I don't want to go, but that's it. Or, uh, I, you know, uh, people will like me better if they think I'm a Christian. Or I might get ahead. Or I've heard about he, health, being healthy and being wealthy and all that type of stuff. And so that's why I'm coming. So I can have power. I can have what I want. Not because I need to be changed from the inside out. Look at what Peter says. May your money perish with you. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness. Pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now, you would hope here that Simon would go, I have sinned, I have, I'm, I'm wrong. But no, it says, pray the Lord for me so that nothing you have said to me may happen. I, I don't want that bad thing to happen. See, he's still in the transactional thing. Before, he just wanted something good. Now, he just doesn't want something bad. I don't know what happens to Simon in the long run. Hopefully, maybe his heart came around. 
But transformation, folks, we need to recognize this, is going to require some truth and accountability. All of us need a, at some point somebody to, to say something to point out where our hearts, our thoughts, our words are going off stray and need to come back to the Lord. That's how we get transformed. We're told that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And our not minds need some interaction with other people. To be transformed, I need friends in the faith who I can grow together with, who will speak the truth and love to me. And we're told then that after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. But as they did so, they were now preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So these folks who were, you know, kept thinking this is for us, the Jews, this is just for us, are now beginning to see this gospel. But it's at least gone out now to Samaria. But remember what Jesus said? You'll be my witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Philip is going to be a part of that. Let's look at the evangelism of Philip. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandak, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip We're going to look at how he does some things here and then take some lessons for ourselves. And one of the things that we see is that he was sensitive as well as obedient to the Lord's promptings. So often times we we might get that sense that we we need to go near somebody, sit near somebody, talk to somebody. Might be someone we already know, might be a stranger, but we just need to kind of get in that presence. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. So we have to be both open to say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And then if we sense that nudging, move in that direction. And in doing so, he was willing to cross cultures because now he's got someone else, not just a Sumerian, an Ethiopian. We have to be willing to cross those cultural barriers ourselves. The ancient people of that time considered Ethiopia as the ends of the earth. And so here it is. Now, the interesting thing is he doesn't have to go to Ethiopia to do this. And we need to remember, the ends of the earth have come to us. There's that certain little institution there in Bloomington you may have heard about, that little college. People come from all over the world. The the people of the world, they're, they're immigrating here, they're migrating here, they're coming to us. And we can either say, you shouldn't be here, as some people do, or we say, welcome. I have some good news for you. What will be your heartbeat? It says, and Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? So he's reading out loud. That's what they would have done at that time. He says, do you, do you understand that? And Philip, Philip asked, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch's looking at that, and, and he asks, Who is the prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And right then, Philip knows, oh, buddy, have you asked a great question? Because I do know who this is about. This is about Jesus. But notice how Philip starts. He starts with his own question. Sometimes we think that the way to share our faith with other people is just start talking and start telling them things. People only really care about things they want to care about, that they, they only really want answers to questions that they have. So one of the things that is helpful is just start asking questions, not with judgment, 
Not why would you believe that? Tell me what you believe. Tell me what you think about this. Have those conversations. Listen to what they're trying to say. And if you listen well and you ask good follow-up questions and you just have some dialogue, you might get to that point where they'll ask the truer, deeper questions of their heart. Some people will throw up some early roadblocks and make it about cultural stuff. Just be respectful and talk and, and see where the conversation goes. You want to start with questions, not answers, so that you can answer the deep questions of their heart. And so then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. Now, he doesn't get to that point unless he gets near him, puts himself in proximity, asks him a question, gets the conversation going, and now he can tell him about Jesus. And when, notice what he's doing. He's putting the focus on Jesus. Folks, if you share your faith, if you tell about your hope in Jesus, you'll probably get a lot of answers, a lot of stuff, a lot of, well, what about this? All the hot button stuff of the day, and, uh, you know, is the Bible real? And blah, blah, blah. You'll, you'll just get lots of it. And here's the thing, just, just talk about Jesus. You can share, hey, here's my view on these different things, but ultimately, I've, I'm trying to understand who Jesus is and what he has done for me and what he wants from me. And just put that spotlight back on him. It says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, this is one of the passages that leads us to believe that baptism is, is a, an immersion event, not just a pouring or a dripping on it, because if he'd already had, you know, he would have had water there. And he could have just poured some on his head, but they saw a pool of water of some kind and said, let's, let's go down into it. And then they came out of it. And they said, when did baptism come up in their conversation? Whenever he's talking about Jesus. He's just bringing that because he's aiming for a response. So how, what do I do with all this? There's a point where we have to decide, am I going to follow Jesus or not? So when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azadus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea, which is where we find him in Acts chapter 21. Now, as you read that, you might think, oh, he just suddenly, you know, disappeared and then popped up somewhere. Just suddenly that he didn't stick around, he moved on. And the next place that we see him preaching is in this town. But here's one of the things that he understood, and we all need to understand this as well, is that he was a link and a chain. There's the first time someone hears about Jesus, and there's that, that moment where they say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And there are a lot of little links along the way. You might be the first link in that chain, the first person to talk to someone about Jesus. You might be somewhere in the middle. You might be that last one that leads them to say, yes, I'm ready to follow. All of it is important. Don't ever say, well, I, you know, I shared my gospel and nothing really happened out of that. At that moment, maybe. But someone else is going to be a link and a link and a link until that moment comes and maybe years in the making. This Ethiopian eunuch, you know, he, he was already someone, a well of the law of Moses. So he's already kind of turning and moving towards God. Some people have maybe never heard anything. Some people have heard something. The key for us is you don't want to be one of those links that breaks it because of how you treated someone. We are told to share their news 
why we believe with gentleness and respect. Just don't be a jerk when you're talking about Jesus. Don't get caught up in, in, in um, political stuff and everything. Let people see Jesus. That's where our hope is. That's where it's at. When we proclaim him, when we lift him up, people will be drawn. The Bible says that whenever we take communion, that little piece of bread, a little cup of juice, we are actually proclaiming Jesus in that very moment. And here in just a few seconds, we're going to have one of those times. And as you take of it, would, would you pray for someone in your circle of influence Will you pray for someone that needs to hear about Jesus? A friend, a family member that needs to learn about the God who came near, took on flesh, dwelled among us, and then redeemed us to himself through his death on the cross, which we remember in this moment of communion. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you right now that we, have, that we have a chance to be still and to think about what you have done for us through Jesus and to proclaim his death, his burial, and his resurrection as we take of these two little emblems, small but not insignificant. Help us, Father, to think about the people we know so that we can learn from, take what we've learned from Philip and bring them the news of Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen.